Hey everyone, back again. Today I'm going to talk about Jacques Derrida's Cogito and the history of madness, or Cogito. I don't know, I've gotten yelled at for not knowing how to properly pronounce that, but in any case, correct me in the comments if I did it wrong. So this text is a response to Foucault's madness and civilization, specifically Foucault's treatment of Descartes, René Descartes. So what I'm going to do is next week, I'm going to follow up with Foucault's response to Derrida's critique, which is super interesting. Both of these texts are super interesting. And so we're going to get some theory drama here. Now, before jumping into it, if you want to follow me anywhere else other than on YouTube, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy to see mostly pictures of my cats. If you want to help me out, you could like, share, subscribe. Most of the people that watch this aren't subscribed. So do that and you'll see videos I release every week and sometimes I release more than one a week. So that would be uh, great. If you want to help me out monetarily, you can do that via Patreon or PayPal, which would also help me out, but no pressure. And finally, if you're listening to this on YouTube or if you found it on YouTube, you can find it in podcast form pretty much anywhere you get podcasts where there shouldn't be any ads, which is obviously better or vice versa. Check it out on YouTube and you can sometimes see my face if that's what you're uh, interested in at all. Now, if you haven't already just skipped to this point, uh, I don't want to waste any more of your time here. So let's jump into Cogito and the History of Madness. Or Cogito. Cogito and the History of Madness. So as Foucault's former disciple, Derrida strives to open a dialogue with his former uh, master, his former teacher, albeit a polemical dialogue, so uh, an argumentative dialogue. So despite this, he's reticent to consider this a challenge, a challenge to Foucault. However, he can't help but feel the fear that it will be that is interpreted as a challenge given the power dynamic that is implied of a teacher and disciple interaction or relationship. And so the teacher's voice is always in Derrida's head and he's, he hears the teacher's voice even before he speaks. So Derrida hears Foucault's voice and Foucault's inevitable uh, resistance to what Derrida has to say. So Derrida is setting this out at the beginning to kind of outline that no matter what he says, it is always already filtered through the voice of Foucault, who is kind of avant la lettre, you know, which I'm, I'm using that term uh, improperly. But before Derrida can even speak, Foucault is there and Foucault is guiding how Derrida can speak. And so the disciple must then learn to speak. And what he is choosing to say is essentially, in this case, a critique of Foucault's interpretation of Descartes' cogito in The History of Madness. So this, or this proceeds in kind of an interesting way, where Derrida wants to expose some fundamental problems in Foucault's work, which if you're confused now, that is, if you don't really know what Foucault says about Descartes, you can either keep listening and I'll try to give a kind of brief summary of it, or you can go check out my episodes that I've done on it in which I kind of briefly go over that topic. Uh, the translation that I have sort of omitted some of the longer discussions that Foucault put forward or ideas that he put forward. But in any case, I'm going to try to make it clear as we go along. So hopefully... If you feel a little confused or you feel like, uh, you know, there's too much here for you to necessarily jump into, I'm hoping that I'll be able to kind of clear some of that up. So Derrida wants to approach Foucault or he approaches Foucault essentially to say that he misunderstood Descartes outright. That is, he just misunderstood what Descartes was saying and he attributes this to a problem of translation because the original wasn't written in French, it was written in Latin, but was then translated into French. So that's one layer of Derrida's critique. The second layer is that he feels Foucault to be doing something that he cannot do. Now what that is, is removing oneself from a hierarchical, hierarchical position, from a position within a power dynamic, in order to speak an objective truth about something. Now, in the case of the history of madness, Foucault sought to let madness speak for itself. So Derrida reads that and he's like, hmm, how is that possible if we are always already immersed within a certain, um, let's say in this case, I guess, uh, a psychiatric paradigm, a juridical psychiatric paradigm that always already, or before anyone can even speak, determines the limits and rules 
as to what acceptable speech will be allowed. That is, it determines in advance how we can even talk about madness. So Derrida is really critiquing Foucault's attempt to move outside of the dynamic to kind of occupy a, a transcendent position, a position that exists above and beyond, almost like a neutral observer to this whole dynamic playing out, as though Foucault himself is not complicit in these movements. So those are the two broad strokes of this critique. Now, before jumping into like the nitty gritty of these uh, kind of critiques, Derrida takes it upon himself to reiterate Foucault's position and Foucault's argument so that, you know, people know what he's talking about. That is, he's laying out exactly where he sees the problem emerging in Foucault's text. So as I've kind of already alluded to, Derrida suggests that Foucault sought to lend a voice to madness that was not filtered through reason. So that is one binary we're going to be working through here, through this text and the one I'm going to do next week, uh, which is called, as an aside, I should have mentioned it earlier, is called This Body, This Paper, This Fire, which should go down in the, the Oscars for one of the best uh, theory paper titles ever. But in any case, we have this binary between reason and madness. Now, Foucault sought to let madness speak for itself, as I've already said. So the way that Derrida characterizes that here is an attempt to try and speak madness or the language of madness or let mad madness speak without filtering it through reason. So Derrida is very suspicious of such a possibility, calling it, in his words, an objectivist naivete, which is like, to uh, translates to being like naively objective, as though Foucault could just remove himself from the dynamic as though he's not always already within it. So it is impossible to speak of madness without already speaking the language of reason. That is, you cannot speak of madness even if you are trying to uh, mobilize it against reason without always already speaking the language of reason. So we are kind of stuck in this dynamic. And you might get the sense at this point that Derrida just assumes a kind of relativistic or uh, nihilistic position, I should say, that is, how can we do anything then if we are always going to be just mirroring the same systems we're trying to oppose? In this case, when we try to speak the language of madness or s let madness speak, and we are only replicating reason, does that mean then that there's nothing we can do? No. And Derrida gives us, albeit briefly and very much uncompletely, a kind of guide as to how it could properly be done. But before we get there, we have to talk a little bit more about the way that Foucault sought to speak for madness or let, let madness speak. And that is, he sought not to necessarily let it speak per se, he sought instead to let its, its silence speak. And that is because within this dynamic that we are operating within and that Foucault is writing about, he saw that madness was something that was silenced. So mad people could speak in uh, psychi psychiatric wards as they were emerging, in clinics as they were emerging. It was expected of the those who were considered mad to speak. But that speech was essentially being shot into a vacuum or into a black hole that just absorbed it, not for the necessarily the not necessarily to make these people's lives better but instead to proffer up the illusion that the, these clinics, that these psychiatric wards were necessary and that they were helping these people without necessarily doing it. So Foucault was doing, in his words, or performing, I should say, an archaeology of silence. That he was, he was trying to look at the silencing of certain voices, in this case, uh, madness, those people considered mad, and how within that silence we can find out a lot about the kind of sociopolitical, uh, cultural dynamic from which it, it, it exists or within which it exists. But Derrida, again skeptical, says that as long as you're working within this logic of an archaeology, as long as you're performing an archaeology, you are always within or always already within a kind of domain of order and reason. That is, you are always abiding by a certain logic. So in, De in Derrida's words, he says, order is then denounced within order, pointing to the limit of Foucault's project. So by contrast, Derrida says that in order for a proper 
and I'm using that word kind of loosely, but in for Derrida, the way that this kind of project should have been conducted, it, it could have happened in two two different ways. Either you do not mention the silence, because in the mentioning it, it is essentially reinscribed, or, and these are his words, you follow the madman down the road of his exile. Now, what this does is it refuses to uh, split, that is, to, to see madness as being something that is like always already suppressed by uh, reason or by, or by reason, that, that's fine. Instead, what Derrida is hoping is that if one of these approaches were taken, that is, let's say, for instance, follow the madman down the road of his exile, what we might find is not that this so-called madman is um, on, on, an, on a different spectrum or on the different side of a spectrum than reason, but rather they are much closer than they appear. They don't, they aren't that far apart. And we get this in Foucault as well, and we'll talk about this more next week, but in Madness and Civilization, one of the points that Foucault raises is that it's very difficult to actually discern madness from reason. And one of the examples he gives is someone who claims to be made of glass. And this person who's made of glass doesn't want to be touched by anyone because he'll shatter. And so Foucault says that this person is, for all intents and purposes, corresponding themselves to reason. That is, they are following the Socratic method, where A equals B, B equals C, therefore A equals C, where they are saying, I am a man, or I am made of glass. Glass breaks. Therefore, if you touch me, I will break. So he's being totally uh, reasonable in that way. However, there we know to some extent that this person is suffering from some kind of uh, mental disorder in that case and needs to be treated as such. But it's difficult to necessarily qualitatively determine why that is the case and why not someone else who says that, oh, well, um, let, just to give a kind of silly example, who says that the world is flat, but then anyone else who looks at the horizon, I'm not a flat earther. <laughs> it's like a, everyone's going to think I'm a flat earther. Uh, someone who looks at the horizon sees it flat and they're like, well, you're obviously out of your mind. Like this world is not round. It's very much flat. Like I can see it with my own eyes. Yet one of those things is today because of various tools that have been afforded to us considered rational while one of them is not. So in both, to kind of bring it back, in both Derrida and Foucault, there is a recognition of the intractability. And by intractability, I mean the fragility or the instability of a clear distinction between reason and madness. That is, they blend together and the line between them is repeatedly gets blurred and blurred. So they both recognize that, but the way that they imagine any kind of difference is where they disagree. So Foucault attributes the difference between the two in the emergence of a specific period, that is for him, in the period of classical reason or the classical age in which there were various institutions emerging or various kind of normative frameworks of, of knowledge production and knowledge dissemination that predicated its uh, possibility on the uh, kind of un or the proportional, anti-proportional, the inverse, the inverse of another thing's condemnation. Now, that may have not made a whole lot of sense. Let me let me rephrase that. The only way it was possible to proffer up one set of beliefs as being like the be all end all of possible things of like knowledge, for example, depended upon the equal yet inverse, that is the equal condemnation of another body or other bodies of knowledge. So Foucault says previously, prior to this moment, uh, reason and madness weren't as far apart. That is, they really blended much more into one another. And one of the examples that we could give about this is like how in Shakespeare or in any other kind of these old playwrights, what we saw was the celebration of madness as being, or these people who are considered mad, to be the secret wielders, the holders of truth. Now, this is where Derrida gets really skeptical. That is, he's like, it seems strange to attribute this distinction to a specific moment. Instead, he says, 
And this really gets at the crux of Derrida's art, um, kind of overall philosophical project, especially with his idea of deconstruction, which I've done a video on if you're interested in that. And I've also covered his of grammatology if you're interested in that, where you'd get more of this. But for Derrida, the exclusion that we find between or of madness in relation to reason extends much further back in that it is imminent to what he calls logos, to logocentrism, which is an appreciation of full presence, of full speech. Now, to be very brief about that, that is to say that there is an appreciation of immediacy when it comes to communication. Now, we see this all the way back to Plato, where writing, like I'm literally writing, like writing down things on a stone tablet or a piece of papyrus or something, was considered a lesser form of communication than speaking directly one-on-one. -on -one. So for Derrida, he says that as far back as the Greeks, there wasn't a, you know, this celebration of madness as Foucault necessarily lays out. Instead, there was a, an appreciation of one form of speech over others, or I should say one form of communication over others, and that was the appreciation of speech. So the silence that Foucault identifies happening to madness or, or being uh, part and parcel of madness, that is, he wants to, you know, perform this archaeology of silence, can be traced then to this logic of speech, of logocentrism, that sought to foreclose the possibility for, um, or to condemn, I should say, non-speech. So in this way then, the way that madness is treated as silence didn't necessarily just emerge at a specific point with specific institutions. It is instead emblematic of an appreciation of full presence of full speech that automatically kind of repudiates or silences or tries to maintain a certain silencing of an other in order to keep the idea of full speech alive and well. And what Derrida does in his other texts is demonstrate the extent to which this silence or this writing, as it can be kind of uh, associated with, actually comes before uh, speech, which might seem totally counterintuitive. Like, how can writing come before speech? And it's a very convoluted argument, one I can't get into now. But in this case, we can only imagine that madness, as it is being repressed within this framework that both uh, Foucault and Derrida are discussing, demonstrates that madness may have actually predated uh, reason and is actually a necessary component for the constitution of reason. So they are connected. That is, they are almost two sides of the same coin, not one side opposing the other so that that side can proffer itself up. They are absolutely necessary for Derrida. That is, they uh, only differ in their deferral, which is a kind of Derridian way to look at it, in that neither of them have a specific um, essence, a specific definition. They instead only attain their definition by deferring not only their own existence, but positioning themselves in their deferrals against uh, an oppositionary other that is itself per performing these same deferrals. Now, it is this logic of logocentrism that gives birth to the possibility of history and historicity. That is, we see in the, at this point, that is with the Greeks and in the pre-Socratic Greeks, we see the idea of history emerging, especially with written text and whatnot, where writing emerged at a kind of uh, prominent field that would allow us to formulate history, because if everything was just through an oral tradition, we couldn't have, uh, we couldn't have history that is not like the way that we imagine history today, which is very uh, linear, and, and because of that, very reductive, of course. So it is that kind of logocentrism that gives birth to this history. And Derrida suggests that Foucault does not recognize this. And for that reason, he is complicit within it in his own historical kind of method here, his own um, approach to the repression of reason, or sorry, the repression of madness through um, or as being the result of a certain classical age or the emergence of the classical age that sought to repress it. And so Foucault is reinscribing this kind of linear history or historicity within 
uh, the kind of world stage. And this leads Foucault, at least this is how Derrida recognizes, recognizes it, to René Descartes. So for those that aren't familiar, René Descartes is the philosopher who famously said, I think, therefore, I am. Now, to be very brief about it, what Descartes sought to do was to demonstrate that the only way we could know that we exist is through our thinking. So he arrives at that point by starting out saying, I don't know if my hands are mine or if they're just put here by some evil demon or I don't know if the table I'm sitting in front of is real or if it's just like the matrix, for example. I don't know if the glass next to me is real because I don't know if it's just another part of the matrix. So we don't know because we can't necessarily trust our sensory uh, faculties, that is, our eyes, or our smell, sense of smell, ears, uh, whatever. We can't necessarily know if what we are interpreting with these senses is actually giving us the true objects in the world, or if these true objects in the world are actually true at all. Now, in uh, Descartes' text, he then imagines there to be another interlocutor or another speaker, uh, another philosopher who's like, well, you can't, you can't deny the fact that you have a body and that the fire that you're sitting next to is real and the paper that you're reading from isn't real. Like, all these things are real. We can touch them and feel them. To which Descartes says, well, okay, fine. I will concede that these things are real for a moment. But then he says, the fact that all humans dream and that we cannot actively tell the difference between dreaming life and waking life means that we don't know if the reality we are experiencing and the one in which you're telling me, hey, you cannot deny that you have a real physical body, the fact that we can't know if we are doing this in a dream right now reveals another level to this problem and one that kind of encapsulates all of us. That is, it presents a kind of universal issue in our inability to tell reality and the difference between reality and dreams. So Derrida takes, Derrida, sorry, Descartes, Descartes takes this as a point of departure to say, okay, I need to doubt everything. I need to doubt that my hand is my own. I need to doubt that my hair is my own, that this table is real, that I am uh, in reality and that I am not, and that I am dreaming. I need to doubt everything. And what he finds is that as soon as you tear everything down and you are left only with your doubting, you cannot undo your doubting. That is, you cannot doubt your doubt away because that will still mean that you are doubting. You can't, you can't doubt your doubt away because you're still, you're still going to be doubting in that procedure or in that act. So in that way, you are still going to be thinking. And thinking is the last thing left in the endless process of doubting that cannot actually be taken away. So it's in that capacity that he says, I think, therefore I am. So in Foucault's work, Foucault takes Descartes to be kind of one of the first enlightenment figures to begin to ostracize madness as an illegitimate site for the attainment of knowledge. Where people who were considered mad weren't considered with the same legitimacy as someone conducting this kind of doubt, where someone would be saying, uh, I doubt if this shirt is real. Where you, because you doubt that, you could say, well, I'm, I might not be wearing a shirt. But if a mad person says that, then you people would say, oh, well, you're crazy. So there is a dependence on upon a certain kind of method here, that is, or a certain kind of class status as well, where if you are a well-to-do person employing the right kind of language in the right way, you could say without being uh, institutionalized, hey, uh, I don't know if this fire here is real, or I don't know if my body is real, or I don't know if I'm awake or, or in a dream. But if you were someone living on the streets saying this stuff, you would be considered with a kind of ire. You would be looked at as though you needed, you needed help. You needed to be institutionalized. You needed to be kicked out of the city, whatever. So Foucault takes this moment in Descartes and Descartes doesn't, is not explicit about this. He's not saying like, oh, uh, mad people don't, uh, can't attain true knowledge, even though he kind of alludes to the fact that uh, 
he 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 dissuades anyone from thinking that he's like mad, which is in itself it it confirms what Foucault is saying. Uh, but in any case, what we get here is the appreciation of a certain kind of knowledge, a certain kind of reasoning over uh, what what is kind of considered a, an illegitimate form, that is madness. So now Derrida moves in to critique Foucault. So in contrast, Derrida doesn't see a condemnation of madness in the way that Foucault does. Instead, he reads in Descartes a treatment of madness as only a particular case of what affects everyone in terms of dreams or how our senses can, can uh, lead us astray. So specifically, and this is where the problem of translation comes in, Foucault reads in one paragraph uh, Descartes' own words when in fact it is in instead the voice of this other person, this other philosopher questioning what Descartes is claiming to do. So Derrida reads that Foucault mistranslated the, um, the original Latin from uh, being like a kind of uh, confusing nevertheless and with a but, uh, confusing those two words, which led him astray. And it's not really important to get into the nitty gritty of that. But in what came out of it was for Derrida, Foucault misinterpreting uh, Descartes' overall point and his actual uh, understanding of madness. So for Derrida, Descartes is only interested in madness in the kind of moment of sensory perception, being in that kind of field. And he says that, or Derrida says that when uh, Descartes moves from sensory experience, that is how our senses can lead us astray, to dreams as being like a universal thing, he effectively moves beyond the possible condemnation that he is relegating uh, madness to like a separate pole that is not like uh, it can't lead to like true knowledge because for Derrida, he, he's doing that to everything. Nothing can lead us to the kind of knowledge that we want here. Precisely because, we, you know, we need dreams, this kind of universal uh, component of, of, of our lives in order to make the point that this is something we are all confronting. So where Foucault interprets uh, an ostracization of madness is, is instead the ostracization of the entire field of individual experiences in favor of the universal experience of dreaming. So Foucault is reading too heavily into this uh, kind of uh, exclusion as being directed specifically at madness and forgetting that it is directed at everything else. So where we where it leads, that is for Derrida, where, where Descartes' project leads, is to the beyond. It moves beyond immediate individual experience into the universal, which constitutes in itself another kind of binary. That is, we have here a binary between the universal and the individual or the specific. But at this limit point, that is within the universal, within uh, moving beyond sensory perception, we see still the maintenance of madness as a possible category but it is a category that exists among the broader scope of silence that is in this act in this binary uh what we depart from sense perception from individual experience instead of universal experience is the move away from silence that we can't learn anything from to the universal which is full presence uh speech speaking the full language of, of humanity i will say just kind of bluntly and we get, in another sense, Derrida says that even those people that are viewed as being the, at the, of the highest order of society in the case that he gives is like painters who produce extravagant new things are themselves considered as a kind of uh, being equated with a kind of madness. So in that, Derrida really tries to drive home the idea that this split between madness and reason is not a cosmetic one that... Uh, he sees happening in Foucault where it's just like, oh, people who we consider to be mad are, you know, the excluded ones. Instead, it complies to a broader shift that is a broader shift to a certain logocentric tradition that seeks to maintain itself by virtue of forming these uh, binaries that kind of um, emanate from an, an original binary between uh, full presence and uh unpresence or from a distance that shapes all that is to come and so what we see and it's even more ironic that 
Foucault tries to take a position outside of this system, outside of this logocentric system, and Derrida takes him up on that and is like, look, we are already dealing with a kind of transcendent move here, one away from individual experience to uh, this transcendent universal. How can then you claim to be existing outside of it, speaking on behalf or letting madness speak? And so in doing, Foucault reinscribes the very binary that he's seeking to undo. That is, he, without acknowledging this original uh, binary, this original distinction, he is submitting, in this case, madness to an superficial, albeit still meaningful in that it still has effects, position with his um, kind of sketching the situation in this way, with his illustration of an active force of a kind of a moment that forecloses the possibility for reason, or sorry, for madness, that in itself, because it completely forgets about the past of logocentrism, just allows it to keep flourishing. And so where Foucault is really situated in is within the, the realm of madness, like he is, he is right about that, within the realm of the kind of immediate historical but it doesn't get at the the logic of what Derrida calls the hyperbolic, which is that move beyond that is only made possible by the maintenance of a kind of um, non-beyond, a, a kind of imminence that is a uh, something that doesn't leave the earth, in, 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 which, in this case being uh, madness relegated to an individual uh, non-moving position, essentially. So the relationship then between reason and madness belongs to a structure of deferral. That is, their distinction isn't nearly as neat as Foucault lays it out. Instead, they are contingent upon one another, and they blend and fold into one another. So Derrida then continue, or concludes, I should say, by attributing madness uh, a privileged position because it is closer to meaning that is imminence, that is the real world, then the departure of reason to transcendence, essentially, to that place that is beyond uh, real experience and that there is actually, and this goes back to his deconstructive method, there is within the unprivileged term of a binary, that is the oppressed term, the term that is seen as being lesser than the other, a site for the possible not only undoing of that binary, but the recognition that that unprivileged position is really the better one of the two. Uh, and yeah, so that's pretty much that. Uh, you know, tune in next week. I'll do Foucault's response, which to for me, I, I am on Foucault's side of this debate. Uh, but Derrida raises some really good points here that are definitely worth considering. And for the most part, they are saying the same thing. Uh, they, and I think they have the same project in mind. But one of them is more concerned, that is Derrida is more concerned with a broader kind of operation of, for, of, of exclusion imminent to logocentrism, while Foucault is more concerned with the specific historical instances, the, you know, the socio-political and socio-cultural ones. So yeah, in that way, if you like what I did, uh, you know, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends, maybe they'll get a kick of it, and then click on either the left or the right to see another video if you'd like, or go check out any of my other ones. And uh, yeah, catch you next time.